started by doing, we started by doing uh, what we know best, which was to educate the public by organizing events that brought in people that were sued, um, that, that sued the NSA, such as uh, the Internet Archive, the people that, um, uh, you know, Cindy Cohen's um, alongside um, people that worked for the NSA um, and for the, the security apparatus. And we combined it with comedians. We thought it would be a good thing to lighten the topic in order to present it to the audience um, by bringing in comedy and music into our events. And this was in 2013 where nobody really cared much about ethics and tech as much as they do now. Um, and we started our organization then and it's we uh, wanted to make sure that our board reflected the larger community. So uh, from comedians to musicians to members of the clergy uh, to a uh, gentleman who worked 15 years at Google. We have a diverse board that represents us. Um, and we're not funded by any company or any entity, except for uh, one time or a couple of times we received funding from Stop Killer Robots campaigns. In terms of our uh, partnerships, we don't have 50 partners. I would say we have three or four that that, that, mad, that matter. Uh, one is being, of course, EFA and the work that we're doing with uh, the folks at EFF and its partners. Um, we had an event uh, a couple of weeks ago um, that included a number of um, Electronic Frontier Alliance partners and um, including uh, the, the you know, Oakland Privacy, Portland Privacy, uh, stop out of New York. And, um, you know, we try to build a community and to widen the discussion around the issues of not just privacy. In our case, it's broader than that. It's privacy, it's AI, uh, autonomous weapons, um, income inequality that we see in the tech sector, you know, the environmental impact of the tech companies and, and how the, some of them destroy the environment. So there's a lot of different issues that we want to address within ethics and tech. Unfortunately, we have limited resources. We're just a few people, but whatever we can address in our events and forums, we will. Um, there's a uh, myself, a blog writer, uh, writer that uh, is also a board member of Ethics and Tech by the name of um, uh, uh, Brett Wilkins, um, as well as a uh, Christina Deptula, who is on the board and helps us with PR. Um, and so for a small organization, we try to make a lot of noise. Um, you know, we'll go to a protest, bring our big signs and hang out and, you know, uh, with the EFA folks if we can. Um, against Apple or it's um, or any company, and we don't have an issue in terms of being outspoken. Um, and I spent the past 20 years, as Kevin mentioned, working in the tech sector. And I can tell you that, you know, first and foremost, uh, I'm no angel. I was in the rat race, just like everybody else was trying to uh, succeed. Uh, and uh, I should say more of a horse race. Um, trying to succeed in Silicon Valley. And I was in the sales and business development side. I um, started my career working at a retail computer store and worked my way up um, and selling apples. And I think it was, oh God, uh, Mac, Mac uh, Pros at the time, or I forgot, it was 1992, 93, 94. Um, selling MacBooks and um, uh, Apple products and working for a system integrator. I learned how to sell products really by working for Bay Networks where I learned switching and routing and hubs and, you know, um, got my career underway in terms of learning my sales skills. I uh, got lucky, went to a very cool startup called Exodus Communications. They were the pioneers of the data center and co-location space. And uh, I worked there for a couple of years. 
learn camaraderie and building sales teams and what it takes for good sales leadership uh, from the executives there and had a great experience. Um, from then on, I uh, started my own company called Something Now, Warranty Now. We sold extended warranties and service contracts, um, raised about $25 million. And that's when I learned that it's really not a good opportunity to raise money from media companies. And media companies will try to sell you a bunch of media that you can't use um, as part of an uh, investment deal. And you're better off uh, going to investors that don't come with a bunch of media garbage and baggage trying to buy their products. I learned that lesson the hard way with something now. Um, unfortunately, the market collapsed in the dot-com bubble, and we were one of the victims of that and had to shut the business down. And that was disheartening, um, you know, because you promise people and investors and employees a job and opportunity and it goes wrong. And uh, it always impacts people, you know, when companies go belly up, um, when shareholders have to hold the bag, um, it always impacts the people and employees that are in that company. Um, and it had an impact on, on a few people that I was close to and, um, and I still remember them. Um, after working at the, my own firm, uh, the Warranty Now, I went over to Quest Communications. I learned how big telcos operate um, and how they skip out paying their sales reps in terms of commissions and bonuses um, in, and compensating them. And, um, you know, and I found out that the labor board doesn't really care about what happens with employees. You know, they're not going to go to, to bat for you in terms of being able to claim those comps. And um, then on, I went to a French software company and I worked for Europeans and I uh, had an interesting experience. It was all good and well until um, <laughs> um, until, you know, they wanted to grow the business and they didn't find a place for me and wanted to get rid of me. And that happens in the tech sector. Um, they owed me about $35,000 in compensation, which they didn't want to pay. I ended up taking into court. Um, they ended up settling for much more dollars than that. And one thing that we were learned in the process was that if you are an employee and you sue your employer, they can't come to you and say, hey, you have to pay our legal bills now if you lose. Because if you make it in a way that the legal bills are paid for by um, the prevailing party, then nobody would sue their employer because nobody could afford the, the lawsuit in terms of the legal bills and the lawyer fees. So that's one thing I learned at Neocase. What I learned with FAST was that it was a pleasure to work with Norwegians. It's, uh, Europeans are incredible people to work with. They're smart, sophisticated, intelligent, yet you know humble. And um, it was a real pleasure to work with them. And I had a great experience till FAST got bought, acquired by Microsoft. And uh, I decided in 2008 to start a company called BizCloud um, and hire a bunch of people in Belgrade, Serbia. So I built a team in Serbia, went back and forth a number of times um, to interview candidates, to, to work with them. And um, I think in my overall career, it was one of the biggest highlights of my life has been to be able to work with people that are abroad, that are different than myself, that believe in different religion, that come from a different background and build com camaraderie with them, build uh, uh, a working relationship with them, be able to work on a joint project together. And um, I made some amazingly good friends uh, some wonderful people that I came across, some great travel experiences to the Balkans. And I would always recommend anybody that's thinking about hiring folks abroad is to get on a plane, go and see them, 
get a chance to interact with them in person. Um, and that's a wonderful way to build your team and, and build your the community you want around your product and, and get people to buy into your vision. So definitely take the time to go out and see them. Um, at BizCloud, one of the stories that's in my book is what happened in terms of trademarks and trademarks that I had. A trademark is a creator's way of distinguishing his work from everybody else. If, um, you know, Coca-Cola or 24-hour fitness of the world can enforce their trademarks so nobody can compete with them. But for small business such as mine, even though we had a registered trademark, we got tangled up by Computer Science Corporation, CSC at the time. Now, CSC was just a notoriously horrible company to get tangled in, in any way. Um, they were known as the Rotten Company in the UK. Um, they failed a number of projects in North Carolina. Um, they were responsible for these rendition flights of torture, which was basically CIA planes uh, that were being used uh, and supplied by CSC to take people from the various salt pits and torture sites uh, in Europe. And uh, I don't know why a tech company would be in that business, but that's what they chose and that's what they did. So they also decided to pick up my trademark name of BizCloud. And, um, you know, for a number of years, we fought them, we send them notices, notices, told them to stop. And even though we had a US trademark, they went to Europe and filed for a mark there and tried to back end of it and kick us out of our own mark. That basically, uh, we had a lawsuit and um, the lawsuit sent me on a tailspin because it made us force us to share our name with CSC. And um, I didn't want to have anything to do with CSC. And I frankly didn't want to have anything to do with BizCloud at that point. And I jumped off a perfectly good balcony trying to kill myself and uh, ended up breaking my back, my pelvis, my ankles, and being in a hospital for four and a half months. And um, that's just the stress, you know, when you're involved with not just CSC, but, you know, the four of their partners in terms of a lawsuit. And um, you know that you can't buy justice like the way they can. Because at the end of the day, the justice system here in America is based on the number of experts you have. How many experts can you bring in into the courthouse? And those experts are usually, you know, university professors or people in the industry that charge twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to come in and testify. Well, a big company can afford an endless number of those, while the small guys good luck to get one or two experts to talk on their behalf. So I learned the hard way that really the justice system doesn't work for the little guy. The, the little guy has no representation um, fighting big tech. And um, came out of um, the... Um, came out of the broken back uh, of the, the hospitals. And I decided, you know, people claim that we're not a cloud computing company or what have you. I had shut down BizCloud at that time. I said, you know, I'm gonna go and work for the biggest, baddest cloud computing vendor there is, um, just to prove that, you know, I belong in this field. And I got a job working for Amazon as a senior alliance manager for big data and analytics. And um, I, in my first year of working at Amazon, I had four different managers. And um, at the same time, my partners that I managed that were assigned to me were big data partners. Um, and they were very happy with my work. They awarded us, you know, partner of the year award. And that's with no manager above our heads uh, telling us what to do. So um, a lot of the work that we did at Amazon was, was rewarding in terms of working with, the man, with these partners. Um, but the way we treated these partners was just not right. 
I remember once um, reInvent is coming up. We had a partner that had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing with us. And um, they had made a request, their executives had made a request that we should take him out for dinner, their team out for dinner after a year of working with us. And um, Amazon executives at first said, yes, we'll do it. They gave me the task of finding the cheapest restaurant I can find in Las Vegas to accommodate uh, my poor partner. And uh, I found the cheapest restaurant, came back with you know what it would cost. I think it was $50, $60 a head for a Mexican restaurant. And then they came back and they said, no, we're gonna cancel it. You know, we're not gonna treat anybody out for a meal. Um, and I thought, you know, here's a company that's making billions and billions of dollars and it won't even take the smallest step in terms of, you know, uh, treating its partners kindly. And that was just, just a, such a cheap move by AWS management. And, um, you know, it's uh, not the frugality of Amazon. It's just being cheap uh, as a company. It's just disgusting in some ways. Um, and then the other part is, is like, uh, frankly, partners of Amazon should not have their business models compared. You know, they should not be in a position where they have to know each other there's business models uh, is getting compared at Amazon while Amazon is coming up with competing products and services. So uh, I think that's unfair to these partners. But, you know, Amazon is, is like a fire hose. Uh, if you are in the tech sector and you want to get customers, you're going to go to the top three vendors when it comes to cloud infrastructure, that being Amazon, Microsoft, or Google. And those are the ones that uh, everybody wants to partner with at the end of the day. A guy like me who doesn't really like to work with any of them um, is gonna probably stay out of a job for a long time because I don't wanna go and work with Amazon. You know, People wanna hire me and give me a job and say, go work with AWS. Well, I have no interest to do that. If I did, I would have figured out a way to kiss ass and stay at AWS. So um, anyways, that's my career up to this point in terms of what I've done. Um, you know, one thing that I always end up asking uh, hiring managers in my interview process, uh, when they say, you know, do you have any questions for me? And maybe this is the reason why I don't get a job is because I always ask them, you know, what kind of project are you willing to walk away from Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Company X, you know, who are you going to say no to? You know, what was the last deal or contract you said no to that you thought was unethical? Because just because you're incorporated doesn't mean I need to do business with you. Just because, you know, you're building and working on the next technology for weapon system doesn't mean I need to do business with you. So if you, it's up to you to choose who you want to work for. So make a point of it to ask upfront, you know, what these companies um, represent by who they work for and what kind of projects they're willing to say no to. And uh, that's how I evaluate um, tech companies is based on them telling me no. Um, what else I can share with you? The book Ethics in Tech came from my experience of working at Amazon um, and at the big tech companies. I thought what I saw was just the despicable. I mean, what's going on in the tech industry is just disheartening these days. Um, this is not the tech industry that I got into many, many years ago. Um, it's a, what I call is uh, greed learning. We are dealing with uh, brute force machine learning and <laughs> buying and selling stocks and in our Bitcoin tradings of the world. And um, we have underlying capitalism that doesn't care about the people. So um, it's capitalism combined with machine learning um, and producing greed learning. And um, what I see is unfortunately, a lot of people can participate in this uh, 
the system that we have created in the stock market, in the Bitcoin market. They don't have the ability. They don't have the ability to be able to play in the financial games. You know, if you think about the, the poor, the people that don't have enough money to survive, they're not going to be able to buy shares. They're not going to be able to make investments. Um, and they're kind of excluded from the opportunities that um, the folks with the algorithms have. And um, we need a more equitable society um, because every day we're creating more and more poor people in this country uh, while the billionaires enjoyed the riches. San Francisco has got something like 67, uh, 67 billionaires, I believe, uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco uh, alone. Um, I don't know how, what the numbers are, but we're, you, know, you guys are getting Elon Musk. So maybe uh, we'll be able to smoke weed for legal. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but um, at the end of the day, these kinds of people scare me because they're so in it for their own greed. You know, they can't spend the money they have gained in their entire lifetime. Um, and yet they need more. And they could do so much good with it. Unfortunately, they choose not to. Um, so, you know, what do we do as activists? What is it that is going to bring us together and say we need to build a community to make sure our voices is heard, to make sure the voices of the poor is heard, make sure the voices of the people that don't have it, the people that get discriminated against are is heard. Um, and I think we just need to focus on a strong community. And by a strong community, I mean different members, different members of people that we don't usually collaborate with, people that we don't usually sit on the same table with. We need to expand our horizon and include them in our day-to-day -day activities and in terms of outreach, in terms of reaching to these communities and making sure that if tomorrow we need a base to call upon, that tomorrow we need to be able to organize a protest in front of an Apple store or in front of Facebook offices, or you know, we need to do a protest online and sign a petition that we can count on these activists, that we can count on these community participants to um, join us and to contribute. You know, um, our lives is enriched by the communities we built. And um, people say, you know, I'll kind of start with, I was going to start with what you want on your tombstone, because I always think about, you know, people and what we all want on, our, on the day we go from this earth. And uh, it doesn't really matter, I guess, but, you know, on always think about what I wanted on my tombstone. When I was a kid, I always thought I want to be a teacher. Or I want to be known for telling people, you know, the truth. Um, as I got older, I realized I want to be an activist. I want to be known for being an activist on my tombstone. Um, I'm not an agitator or, uh, you know, anything of that nature, but somebody uh, who um, is contributing to uh, society as an activist. And that's my goal um, in my life uh, in terms of what I want to be able to achieve. And uh, frankly, it would be nice to have a job again. I don't think anybody is going to hire me after the books I've written and after working in ethics and tech. But if, you know, actually somebody uh, that would look at sales and business development people um, would love to talk to them about it so I can get a job. And that would be nice. But um, that's all I got. I uh, don't want to take up too much of your time. I thought I didn't know how long these sessions run. So I think you said a couple of hours, uh, but let's open it up, up to up to. I always uh, tell speakers they can talk as long as short as they want, with the asterisk that we technically usually book the room for about two hours, and I usually try to tell speakers you start going much over an hour, it starts getting a bit draining on people. But I, I've had speakers have used the full two hours, and it was interesting for most of it. <laughs> so, so if you're uh, if you if you're mostly getting to the point where you've uh, said. The main stuff you wanted to say, I mean, we certainly can go to Q&A mode immediately if you'd like, if you don't have any more major yeah, One last thing I was going to say is as uh, ethics and tech, we need some resources, you know, 
we could use some help in building our websites and making sure our sites stay secure and uh, making sure that we make updates regularly and uh, we could use resources. So if you guys have resources in Austin that can help us in those kinds of endeavors, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, Certainly happy to do what we can. We, we also need a lot of the resources you mentioned, but uh, we're happy to try to spread the wealth however we can. Awesome. And, and, and I'll just also say, you know, you, uh, you could make a book out of your life story. It's just, it's crazy everything you've been through, but I, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, it takes, it takes bravery to share everything you share for the cause. So I just, I want to thank you for that. Sure. No, it's just been some real life experience. I'm telling you, I'm no angel. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not either. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, I thank you so much. I mean, that's just, I mean, I now realize I'm just going to go down a rabbit hole reading about Computer Sciences Corporation, because apparently they used to be the biggest software maker in the United States in the 60s, and I know almost nothing about them. So I bet that will be an interesting rabbit hole. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, George. I just wanted to say that... Um... It's interesting because I'm interviewing for jobs now, although I do have an activist position I might get that's not, it's a little different, but um, that idea of asking what projects have you walked away from is brilliant. I'm going to start doing that because like if someone doesn't have the right answer, you know, I don't, I really do want to work for an ethically good company. Um, and that's a great question to kind of suss that out. So thank you for that. Sure. And, and on that topic, I, uh, I'll add a little thing on for, you know, I work, I work at a startup myself as a senior software engineer. And um, one thing I'll say that is something to look for, because working for an ethical employer is important to me, obviously, or I wouldn't be running this. Like, I've never worked for any of the FANG companies, you know, because it's, you know, even if your department is ethical there, as he, you know, correctly points out, your department may be ethical, but the, the thing is a behemoth, you know, other departments may not be so ethical. But one thing you can look for is how your startup or the company you're thinking of working for is structured corporately. Particularly, you can look for something called a public benefit corporation or a PBC. What's cool about this legal structure is unlike most incorporated companies who have a fiduciary duty uh, to the shareholders, the board to maximize profit no matter what, with ethics not being in the conversation, a public benefit corporation, the board can actually tell the shareholders, we're not going to do the thing that leads to maximum product because it goes against the mission statement of the company and they won't get sued for violating fiduciary duty if they're set up with that structure. So something to look for if it is something that uh, matters to you. My, my company is registered as a PBC. Yeah, we're uh, registered as a 501c3. That's a, that's a yeah, common pure. PBC is more if you're looking a, uh, a for-profit place to work that uh, you want a little more ethical safeguards than your average company. I'm, I'm not saying that they can't, like any other company, make unethical decisions, but it just means that they legally have the right to make ethical decisions, which in America, weirdly, most companies don't actually have the legal right to do the ethical thing if it will lose money. <laughs> yeah, and it probably, I would guess that most companies that structure themselves that way do it because they care about it. Yeah, like my, my company, it's yeah. literally our, our mission statement. You know, we we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't care. Um, and I guess one other thing, this is rarer than finding PBCs, but you can also look into uh, uh, worker cooperative based companies. They tend to have much more direct stake from the employees and what they do. They're fairly rare in the tech industry, though there actually is one here in Austin called Polycot Associates that one of our board members was a co-founder of, though he is retired from there now. So um, there definitely are ways to find a way to put your skills in tech uh, to gainful employment, but, uh, you know, try to hold true to your ethics. Uh, do we have uh, other questions? I certainly could ask a few questions, but I want to make sure we get questions from everybody else. So, um, so yeah, you can either message me a question or you can uh, raise your hand and I'd be happy to unmute you and you can ask it directly. And it's also fine if people don't have too many questions, I certainly can ask a few questions if, People are mostly uh, cool. 
Um, yeah, all right. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm also being asked to plug a uh, Austin-based organization who are pretty cool called Tech Workers Coalition. They are uh, Austin Tech Workers Coalition. They're a coalition of workers in and around the tech industry, labor organizers, community organizers, and friends. Um, yes, Tech Workers Coalition here in Austin are awesome people. Um, I, my friend Aslan does quite a bit of work with them. But um, but yeah, they're, uh, particularly if like the fact that there are no unions in the tech industry is an important issue to you, they're the people you should get talking with. Um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, good, good call out there. Um, yeah, let me think. What would be? Sorry, yeah. There's some concerns that we have. I mean, that we should probably talk about um, the whole idea of this deep fake that 60 Minutes just did a uh, segment on this week. Um, yeah. Weekend was just uh, so. Um, yeah, actually, I mean, that might be an interesting question because you know, you you were for Amazon. They use a lot of these machine learning technologies and various things. I mean, what? I mean, I think any people. Who, people like us who work in tech, we both are less terrified of the tech than ordinary people because we know the magical stuff it can't do that some ordinary people think it can do. But we're also still quite terrified because what it can do, especially once it's scaled up, it is pretty is pretty scary actually. Like, what what do you think we can do about the problem if anything? Like, I mean, how do we actually get these companies to have ethical safeguards on deploying these systems. At the end of the day, I just think that we need to have regulations and that the only thing that they're afraid of is um, two things, how, uh, how it impacts their investors and how it impacts their PR. And if we can make an impact on those two plus regulations, you know, from activist perspective, they can reach out to investors, know their business practices, Tell them not to invest in these companies unless they change X, Y, and Z. And from a PR perspective, go after them when they launch a new product, when they have a new product offering. You know, let's go to Las Vegas for uh, for reinvent. But let's be outside, passing out flyers and connecting with people via vocal horns, uh, as well as you know, buying ads on uh, Google's of the world to make sure people see our content uh, if we need to, you know, talk um, against Amazon's business practices. Um, I think those kinds of things are, are very effective. You know, well, one thing we did, for example, that I know really pissed off CSC was when VMworld had conferences here in Moscone Center, uh, you know, we had protesters from Occupy that came out that protested against CSC uh, during the lunch hour, um, during the conferences. And that that's what they care about, is their PR, their image. Um, so if you can hurt their image, or if you can reach out to their investors to say not to invest in these companies, you have done a, a huge milestone um, in terms of service. And it I, looks like, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, you go ahead, George. Oh, I was just going to say, it looks like Facebook has done that to themselves, basically. Um, and, you know, we'll see the outcome of that. But the, the accusations, which are well documented, are super serious. So that's that's where it might, there's a possibility that that, um, that coming out could possibly lead to um, new regulations on it. Yeah. But you know what, it's just, it's going to take us a whole collective to make sure that these news pieces stay in the headlines. We have a tendency to forget in this country, you know, a war happened. Oh, two weeks later, we forget about it. Uh, you know, we, um, uh, you know, COVID breaks out and we get our cures and six months from now, we're going to be all, you know, forgetting about what happened. I just think that, you know, I hope I hope we don't. I hope we, we have a more longer memory. That that actually, yeah, gets to an interesting question I would have in general, which is like, yeah, how how do you know we people who really care about these issues, we tend to stay engaged on them and follow them even when the news cycle leaves them. But like how how do we keep the sustained pressure up when the news cycle starts moving? Because I even think here uh, in Austin is a good example is um, this isn't directly related to EFF Austin's work. But it sort of tangentially crosses over. But I personally was somewhat involved in uh, 
some of the uh, Black Lives Matter protests that happened, uh, not this summer, but the summer before, um, I, um, I specifically was one of many people who called into city council about the police brutality against the protesters. Uh, apparently, I made a very good case because I was actually contacted by the local news afterwards to be a talking head about the issue for the evening news. And no coincidence, I saw a couple of uh, police cars parked outside my house the evening that aired, actually. So uh, and I'm sure that was a coincidence. But um, but the thing was, is that so there was anger when the police like injured these activists, some of them like life threatening injuries. And like there were literally 300 people who called into the Zoom council meeting screaming like, you know, fire the police chief, fire the city manager, fire any council member who won't fire them. And everybody was so up in arms. And yet here it is a year later, and most of these people never got fired, never really got held accountable because the public forgot about it and moved on. And now only the really hardcore activists care anymore. There's not that public rage coming for their heads anymore. And I'm just, so I, so I think you really, it's exactly there. Like these tech companies, they ride out their latest scandal. They never actually change anything. What do you have thoughts on like ways we can break that narrative? Yeah, my, uh, I think it's just a matter of being persistent. You have to be out persistent your enemies. And you have to look at different ways of being able to get the news out. You know, who are your advocates? Who are your uh, organizations that are like-minded? In our case, organizations like Code Pink are like-minded. Uh, Stop Killer Robots campaign is like-minded. You know, they work at national level. Uh, we work at a local level. Um, but you know, we can bounce off of each other um, and work on ideas and get it out there in terms of um, being able to get, continue with public support. Otherwise, yeah, you, people lose interest. Two months later, six months later, they forgot about it and they've moved on. Well, you know, that injustice has never been fixed. Yeah, um, we got a couple of questions on our eyes here. So I'm gonna first unmute uh, Sungiz here. Oh, hi. Um, I was, I just watched this, uh, YouTube clip of Ted talk yesterday. I think it was, um, online change is hard to organize and it was giving an example of, um, black activists, um, back in the day when they were going, um, big and it was pre-internet and, uh, the Ted talker was saying that part of the reason the movement was had teeth or was able to make change was because the activists kept going through trials. They had to like sneak into dormitories and start mass printing leaflets. And that required great uh, logistics and great coordination. And it made sure that the people were completely on board and engaged with what they were doing. Um, and that's what gave them teeth and got the legislators, you know, moving was because there was this constant push and constant activity that was going on in the background. So when you saw images of all these protesters in the streets for the Black Lives Movement, legislators were scared because these people were active. Um, and when you get online movements, you have people who show up instantly for the day because they saw the hashtag and then they ran to the streets. They don't have the trial and the push that's going on. And when you see movements like politicians getting into power, part of the reason that there's this huge push that's putting them in power was because they've been working for months on building up the people. Um, and so to have the sustainment, I think we need to build from the ground up, if that makes sense, rather than have the movement on the day. And yep. so what you were saying with the police is that people were angry in the moment, but they didn't have the connections. They didn't have the small groups of where to go for their leader um and they didn't have like the committees to keep everyone activated and going to sustain the movement and that's why people are like eh, they were there in the streets for like two minutes and then they're gone the next day because these people sure they were angry but they don't know where to go next and they don't know how to they don't have the people around them to build the vibe if that makes sense yeah and so they yeah. don't seem such a big threat yeah. so but you know what, I try to build it in the communities of tech workers, you know, all these campuses that they have built for tech workers are so locked down. It's like, 
they live in a world of their own while there's an outside world that operates outside of their community you know um you go down to google campus or you go to apple's campus um it's not inviting for an average joe to walk on that campus and interact with tech workers uh, which makes it challenging in a way you know how to interact with people that spend you know 60 hours a week working and living in their own community where they have their own dry cleaner and laundry yeah. and food you know if if I uh, if I didn't know any better, I would almost think this might have something to do with why the big tech companies are so desperate to get their employees back in the office. Because if they're no longer in that enclosed campus environment, well, suddenly they're not cut off from the real world anymore. Now, are they? <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> um, we got a question here from Carl. Yeah, I know we've uh, there's been a lot of talk about you know, surveillance, you know, on a, I guess on a macro level, especially by the government and police, but I'm thinking more like on a micro level. Because recently I've been like really close at getting some jobs. They really liked my resume on Indeed or LinkedIn. And then all of a sudden I'm not a fit. So I'm thinking what's happening is I look good initially, but then once I make it you know, to a certain point, they say, well, let me Google this guy. <laughs> no, and, Google oh, Google he's Google. hanging out with uh, Kevin, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I, I would hope I'm not terrible for one's employment, but I think to Carl's point that it's like, yeah, Carl is a very uh, involved activist here in Austin. And, uh, you know, he, he's opinionated in his beliefs, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, so that's an interesting question, you know. We paranoid tech types tend to definitely, you know, be like, you know, we both under and overplay how much these companies know about us. But like, I mean, like a company like Amazon, like if you're applying there, like how big a deep dive on your web presence do they do on you when they're thinking about hiring you? Do you have any insight into that? Um, I think it took them three weeks to run my background check. So, um, you know, and and. The fact is, is companies on the background check and could include all sorts of information from your credit history to, um, you know, companies you worked for. And of course, it could be a check that's not really uh, with with uh, with your permission going behind your back and talking to people that you worked with and getting their feedback on you and they could do that just as well you know you're giving them permission to do well, a reference well a company like uh, amazon like will is it for like big tech things like that is it like a red flag if they notice a potential employer has a, a history of tech activism and being a troublemaker and caring that the product's being used ethically and not just maximizing profits like well have you seen them go like oh uh, we don't want to hire this person they're going to be trouble um, I haven't, but uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that exists. At the end of the day, Amazon is in the business of hiring people that fill its mold, um, that they can have uh, buy off on its leadership principles and follow uh, Jeff Bezos uh, dogma. And uh, that's what they want. Um, you know, when people like me that speak up, um, are not welcomed in an organization like that. One, one thing that people can do if you're not a, you know, you're an activist, but not a leader like uh, like you are, is sock puppet accounts. You know, you can at least um, keep your identity away from your social media presence when you're doing that kind of work. Uh, I've, I've had those in the past. Well, and, and certainly I, I would definitely recommend uh, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you definitely want to be careful with, you know, as, as I always, you know, <laughs> I've had people over the years who have sometimes asked me things of borderline legality, and always the first thing I tell those people is, well, regardless of whether I agree or disagree with particularly what you're thinking of doing, we should not be having this conversation in Facebook Messenger, you know, do oh, it on yeah. Signal, you know, <laughs> exactly, and so, but yes, I mean, certainly, you know, depending on your risk profile, I mean, yeah, you know, I, 
I tend to be pretty outspoken in my beliefs. So I just tend, and I have such a known presence at this point as an activist that I don't know if I could really fix my reputation with sock puppet accounts, but certainly at the same time, yeah, you know, managing your online identity and your accounts, uh, depending on what you're doing. And if you worry about big tech caring about it, uh, it's a tactic, it's, it's something to consider. Um, I got a question here that was asked oh, okay. in the chat. Um, so I had a question and it sort of ties into something that was already said here, but like, uh, in your opinion, Vahid, what, what can the average person do, do to get involved with these sorts of ethical issues and make a difference? What if you're not even a tech worker, much less an industry leader? Oh, what I would do is get involved with the various organizations, find out when they have events. You mean like um, EFF Austin or Ethics and Tech? Right. <laughs> exactly. Find out. Come to our event. You know, our event has got comedy in it. It's got poetry in it. It's got, you know, um, big tech uh, speakers, but it's a variety of discussions and we try to make it entertaining and, and fun. So you get an education and you get to be entertained at the same time. Um, check out the online petitions against some of these companies, see what's going on in terms of um, uh, the concerns that people have on you know, change.org or roots action against big tech. You know. Uh, go and sign on on these petitions for various congressmen for them to hear um, um, your views. Get educated. At the end of the day, everybody has an interest, you know, just like people, I have an interest to know about pharmaceutical industry all of a sudden. Um, you know, shit happens in this world that is going to say, you know, Facebook is harmful to kids. Facebook is a danger to kids. Um, and you need to be educated to protect your kids. You know, that's your duty in, in this society. You can't pass the buck. You know, nobody else can go out and do that for you. Um, but pick a few organizations, let them lead, let them, you know, tell you what petitions to sign, what events to attend, you know, but, you know, go and do your selection of the orgs first and then dive deeper with each and see how you can get involved with each. Uh, we need the voices now more than ever. And um, the tech lobbyists, I mean, it's a scary world. You know, they have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars buying politicians. And of course, the politicians respond in kind and look the other way. So, um, you know, we don't have the, that kind of lobbying power, um, but we can definitely have a voice if we are united. And, um, and, you know, I'll just, I'll just add on that, you know, I, I think that's right, you know, and I'll give my own just thoughts on that question real quick, where I'll say, you know, eventually, if you care about the issue, it is, it's your own responsibility to get educated on the issue and become informed. When I started caring about this stuff, you know, a little over a decade ago, um, I didn't know very much about a lot of these topics, and I have gotten uh, pretty informed on them as I've done my activism. That being said, it's absolutely a good idea to pick a few orgs in this space you trust um, and you start kind of getting your own sense of what you believe on these issues as you gain the nuance to understand them and argue effectively. The EFF is obviously a great one to follow. Um, Fight for the Future is another good one, especially if you care about crowdsourced activist uh, petitions and actions. Fight for the Future is usually really good at getting big visibility on an issue quickly. They, along with EFF, were one of the main people behind the Soper Pipa protests a decade ago. Um, that was one of the first major successful examples of mass uh, internet activism. And, um, you know, a lot of it really, and, you know, I think we keep dancing around this, but I will say that a lot of it is, I think, about creating and sustaining a, a sense of community, you know, like, um, as we were talking about, about, you know, that you don't just show up when there's an emergency, that there's that constant level of being ready, you know, and that comes from a community, you know, like, I always like to joke, like, you know, yeah, I intentionally play up that, haha, we're a bunch of uh, cyberpunks. And I'm, I'm doing that, you know, very tactically, because, hey, that's fun, you know, it's, it's rebellious, it's cool, it's got good marketing and image, you know, and I'm not just, you know, I'm doing that because, yes, I, I enjoy cyberpunk literature and stuff, but it's intentional, too. It creates a sense of community, and this is something that I think uh, you can consciously choose to do with uh, your own activist community, cultivate that sense of community. Um, let's see, I got a couple questions here. Uh, first, I guess I'll go with uh, George there, and then I think Singhis has her hand up. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was just going to mention, I saw an interview recently. Um, Trevor Noah on The Daily Show interviewed Greta Thunberg, and it was out, you know, the relevance here is um, he asked her the question, what can an individual do? And her answer was very similar to what you just said, get informed. And but her her take on it was if you know once you get informed, if you're sufficiently informed, you'll figure out what to do. And I thought that was good advice. And it's it was only a couple of weeks ago. It's Trevor Noah. I would advise watching it in addition to it was an awesome interview, and her sense of humor came across. It was really cool. She's awesome. <laughs> but, but 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 the alt right part of the internet told me she's humorless and terrible. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> oh yeah, well yeah. <laughs> Um, was it, yeah, Singers, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking that in this, I guess, activism industry, um, a lot of the people who are involved of it seem to be like people who know about law and people who know about tech. And for the common layperson, um, I don't know much about technology and I don't know much about law. It's very complicated speech, if that you could say. And there's a lot of technical terms and you've got to convey it to people what's going on and simplify the issue um so that the people who are not talking about tech the people who are not talking about law because i don't know about you but law is kind of boring for a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> and so is technical terms that i don't know much about and yes we've got to get into it and educate ourselves but we've got to break it down and simplify these very complex issues so people can get on board and put it i guess storytell it because when we don't know about something we write, we tell stories. And that's kind of what we need to do. We need to find ways of explaining stuff in a way that's engaging. Like you were mentioning comedians that um, that you brought in to talk about issues because that's a lighthearted way of getting people involved. Um, so yeah, it's creating media, creating art, creating it makes it seem kind of hit to get people in. <laughs> I, I think um, that's an excellent point, and and I'd, yeah. I'd like to ask you, as it is, as somebody who has self-identified as not super knowledgeable of the law or tech, what have you found has been helpful to get you personally to care about these issues and understand them? And like, what what has been effective for you? I would um, I would love to learn what has worked on you so I can improve my craft. <laughs> um. I like you said, go to EFF. That's what I did. I just read every day their blog. I just. Um, go to access now and I started looking up organizations and read on their blogs daily that's what I've done and joined groups like this well, um, we're happy to have you so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah that's what I kind of did I kind of had always thought privacy invasions and stuff was kind of creepy and I guess over COVID I started reading a lot more about it because I had the time yeah. um, and I'm getting into it so that's what yeah well yeah and I mean I'll say it's it's not just you to like you're just like oh well I just found the privacy evasion creepy well I mean it turns mm -hmm. out that if you look at uh after World War II at the founding of the UN if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights what do you know what one of those rights is it's the right to privacy like it is a universal human right which most people and especially whoever's running these tech companies seem to forget about a lot I mean you know, there's been a lot of studies on it. There, humans have a psychological need for privacy. We don't function very well if we feel we're being watched all the time. And that's not even getting into all the other harms, but it's just psychologically draining for human beings. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, um, what, what I think is, is just not the issue of privacy. There are issues of income inequality, AI, autonomous weapons. You know, there are things around technology that I think people should just be aware of that's coming down the pipe that's really scary, that, you know, really is going to require us to unite because the lobbyists and the people that are manufacturers of these weapons, that are manufacturers of these security cameras um, that are undermining our day-to-day -day liberties, they're not going to go away. You know, they have every incentive to build on fear. The whole company Facebook is built on fear, and but there's a lot more companies that are being built on fear and distrust between people, and that's how they make their money, unfortunately. So um, we all need to take an interest in, and even broaden the, horse, the, the, the scope of um, things that we monitor on an individual basis in the tech sector.
I, th I think you're quite right. I mean, you know, I see all the attention like Facebook's issues is getting and not that those issues are not important, but, you know, I, me just following emerging tech trends, there are just some things coming up in the near future that uh, I hardly anybody's talking about that uh, I, I hope to get more mass awareness on. Like uh, just the fact read uh, uh, from the uh, famous information, well, you, you may hear my dog in the background, sorry about that. Um, but the, um, the famous information security researcher and Harvard lecturer and EFF board member, Bruce Schneier, uh, if you want to actually understand like hacking or infosec topics in plain English, he's a wonderful resource. Oh, and I should also, of course, tout uh, sci-fi author and EFF advisor, Corey Doctorow. His blog, Coralistic, is wonderful for breaking down these issues in non-tech speak as well. But Bruce Schneier just had an amazing article the other day that was... Uh, just talking about, you know, this is something I see hardly anybody but people in this space talking about, but like, you know, we're about to enter a world where we're all increasingly hearing about these, uh, you know, like pipeline hacks and infrastructure hacks, but we're going to soon get to a point where it's not people doing that. It's going to be AIs doing all the hacking. And uh, literally AIs are going to find vulnerabilities human beings can't even see. And like, you know, the best hacker ever, like every system will get breached once it's AIs hacking everything. And there's, there's no regulation on this at all. And nobody's even talking about it or thinking about it. So I think that is a lot of the point of trying to get involved with works like EFF or uh, Ethics and Tech or EFF Austin is just we, you know, talk about these issues that, you know, your politicians probably aren't even thinking about yet, just because it's an emerging trend. Uh, yeah, George. Uh, one of the things we can do right now, in addition to that, is um, petition our government, which, you you know, you've been doing in Texas, and I'll start doing here to the extent that I can, um, petitioning our government about the police use of these technologies, um, because, you know, police have a lot of power, and once they can use these technologies, it gets invasive in ways that seem to me, not being a lawyer, but they seem to at least violate the spirit of the Constitution. Um, I don't know if the letter of the law, but I mean, but these things should be um, reined in, and that's something we can do right now is talk to our government about police use of facial recognition or what are the yeah. cell things that they use? What I figure those are called the well, stingrays. Um, stingrays, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and I mean, certainly, uh, actually, if uh, for anybody here who cares about uh, facial recognition as an issue, EFF is actually running a campaign uh, that my friend Nash at EFF is spearheading called About Face, which is all about trying to get facial recognition banned by uh, governments and uh, local governments and police departments throughout the country. So you should check out About Face if you want to learn more about that. We, uh, we hope to get some traction on that here in Austin as well. I've heard a little bit of tentative interest from a few city council members when I briefly chatted with them about the issue. We'll uh, see if we are, can get some further momentum on that. But yeah, lo local issues are where a lot of this uh, happens. You know, one thing I just I want to mention, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing I was going to say is that, you know, when you think about the military weapons that are being used within the police departments, um, we just, I mean, forget that and just go to Afghanistan. We just left a country there with $250 million or so in military gear, a country that we've been fighting with for 20 years and uh, left them with all the weapons and came out, including biometric sensors and what else. Now in the US, you know, we are practically giving uh, tanks for people to roll up and down the street with if they wanted to. Um, and weapons that should be never used in a street setting um, and uh, at the hands of the, uh, of the police force. And that's just uncalled for, I mean, you know, yeah. How do you plan to reduce the level of violence in this country if you give everybody a damn gun? I was I was just going to say more on a lighter note. I had spoke with Nash about um, about face, and I asked how long it took him to pick a name, and he goes, "Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we had like 150 choices because I was thinking face off might be a good one, but it, you know, <laughs> it, it was like an ongoing thing, and then they were like, we picked this one, but it wasn't an easy choice, <laughs> right? And and yeah, and you know, but I'll certainly say, you know, that I really do think, you know, focusing on the for those, once again, who are interested in the side of getting involved, I think focusing on the local level can be 
very vital and very important um, because it, it is one where there is less of a political law jam these days. It's where you can have the best chance of meeting these lawmakers, of lobbying them face to face. And, um, and, it's, and as our meetup last month even uh, was about, you know, it's a lot of the creep of the surveillance state comes from things like local police departments abusing digital search warrants, which are way more invasive than uh, traditional old fashioned search warrants. So, and, and you know, and, I, and even more than that, you know, the, the sort of hacker community uh, has a lot of overlap with uh, political cynicism and, and anarchy of various stripes politically. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty far left with uh, anarchist leanings myself, but I, I, ruthlessly advise people to get involved in politics, to vote, uh, uh, maybe even run for office if they're a masochist for punishment. But I, I encourage people, even though I don't have much faith in the existing system, I encourage people to get involved anyway. And, and frankly, a lot of it comes down to my insights as like a programmer, where I'm like, there's a lot of similarities between a systems of laws and government and a computer system. And the truth is, just like a computer system can be hacked systems of laws and governance can be hacked. And no matter how well you design a system of law and governance, if you don't stay an active stakeholder in it, someone will eventually hack that system and break it. So you can talk about, oh, well, this system's broken. I'm going to start my insert new utopian system. And I'm like, but I promise you, if you don't stay constantly engaged with that system, somebody will hack your new system and ruin it. So you may not have much faith in the existing system, but there's my little argument for why you, you need to be involved and it needs to be one of the many tools in your toolkit about addressing these issues. And fortunately here in Buffalo, um, well, there's two things. One is we're pretty close to electing a democratic socialist mayor. Oh, congratulations. Um, yeah, it was actually weird because the incumbent Democrat I don't know. There were lawsuits about him not being able to be in it, even though he was after deadline, but that's beside the point. But I'm, I'm working on her campaign and I was thinking it might be useful to get her involved in EFF or, you know, yeah. I can't call it EFF, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and I'm right. also, I used to be uh, next door neighbors with the county executive and he, you know, I mean, these are people who may not have time, but at least if we're, we have some ideas that people are accessible and you know you guys have um a different situation in austin because you're a state capital um unfortunately sometimes yes <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> or fortunately um, depending on how you look at it yeah and i you know i think our state government here it's funny because like i don't know there's a big difference between the governors of texas and the former governor of new york but he proved himself to be kind of a shithead too um most of them do language. just yeah, live yeah. It long enough <laughs> and now we have a woman in power which is awesome and she's from western new york so i don't know if i can get her here but i might be able to yeah, yeah. You, you, you never know i've had a yeah. few texas politicians here. Um, yeah. before we, uh, you know, I guess we're, yeah, we maybe can start thinking about wrapping it up here unless anybody has any final questions they want to ask our speaker or just us activists in general, um, or have we mostly exhausted the topic to people's, uh, current interest, which is totally fine because we've, uh, you know, I don't, in, I usually, if we get all the way to nine, people are tired by then. So I don't mind, uh, closing things up a little early. Um, well, yeah, if we don't have any more questions before we adjourn, I'm going to just uh, briefly turn things over to our friend uh, Mike Furstenfeld here with Make Every Media, because thanks to Mike's uh, gracious uh, partnership with EFF Austin, he's basically the facilitator of our solution to that we can't have after meetup in person uh, happy hours uh, at these days. Mike basically is the provider of our virtual uh, post meetup gathering for socialization. And I'm going to let him explain what that's going to look like to any of you interested in joining us. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna paste a link in oh, the chat. I think right I just uh, got the link there for you, Mike. Is oh, you did it, one? you just did yeah. it. Yeah, that's yep. the same link. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go there and that'll get you a day pass to our gather space, which is... Uh, Mike, what is a, gather space? So it, it's uh, it's different than Zoom. It'll allow you to navigate around with the arrow keys. You'll have a little avatar. If you haven't ever joined, it'll give you a little tutorial on how to use it. Uh, and you can move around a little custom space. Uh, we've built a little pixel 
pub <laughs> to hang out with. And that's usually where P EFF people congregate in the stage area of that pub. If you, if you move your avatar onto the stage, then you're heard by everyone in the room. But then you can also join little private tables for two or explore the other spaces that we've built. There's a rooftop lounge in there. Um, yeah, and it, it basically you know, simulates in an overhead 16-bit video game style the experience of a uh, real party where rather than an endless wall of Zoom faces staring at you, you can move between conversational groups. Yes, yes. And the closer you get to people, the uh, they'll, they'll, their video screens will pop up and you'll be able to hear their conversations. And then you'll be able to leave conversations you don't like. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it's, um, it's not a substitute for real life parties, but it's the best thing I've found. And it's certainly better than Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a, it's almost a metaverse. I mean, it is it is kind of a uh, intermediary metaverse. It's between, much more you know, cyberpunk not, than Zoom. That is definitely fully immersive. Factor. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, and depending on who shows up, we'll give it about 10 minutes uh, in there. And then um, I've been exploring some of the public spaces in there. So I thought we could take a little tour of a world that has been built uh, recently and opened up to the public that's all nostalgia themed retro video games. You can walk through old retro video games. Uh, so we'll give it about 10 minutes before I take Kevin on a tour of that. <laughs> yeah, so basically everyone, including our speaker is welcome to join if you're free. Um, no obligation to uh, come if you are pooped out at this point. But if you just would like to have a chance to freeform chat with other fellow nerds and activists, uh, you are welcome to join us. You know, this is, as I said, building community is a part of how you keep these things being successful. So this is our attempt to build a community and get to know any of you a little better. Yeah, and please, yeah, check out uh, check out our website too. We're doing our best to be an ethical tech media production company. And it seems like the thing that we run up against is that the more ethical we are, the less money we make. And so that's just like the main issue. So you have to depend on sponsorships and, you know, ethical advertisers and ethical clients because, you know, yes, walking away from a, I mean, that was, that's powerful for me as well. I have learned over the last two years that it is better for me to walk away from a client that is giving me the red flags, the red ethical flags. Uh, it's better to walk away than to try to struggle through it and, and meet them halfway or whatever. And, it just and, doesn't know, work. and I'll just also just say that yeah, Mike's company make every media is very awesome. They also run a very cool uh, Twitch channel with a lot of cool content, some of which might appeal to people in here. He has a uh, VR interviews and virtual reality on, uh, I believe, Wednesdays. So uh, definitely yeah. some uh, content probably of interest to this community. And I mean, full disclosure, uh, in addition to our collaboration here, I run a uh, video game Let's Play segment with Mike on 34th Sundays. So yeah, Yes, they're there. I, but I'm not getting paid, you know, but full disclosure, no, there exactly. is a relationship. We're, it's because you're, <laughs> we're too ethical. We're too ethical. <laughs> uh, too I'm ethical to be paid. Off. I'm going to sign off, uh, but I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, thank you so much for hearing us out. You know, we, uh, you're invited to our events. You're invited to anything that we put together, any support that you need for any initiative that you got going please feel free to email me uh, at your disposal. I'll put the, my email address uh, in the chat session and uh, would love to work with you anyway that you think is appropriate and can be supportive. Well, thank you so much, Vahid. I, I really do think a lot of uh, the future success of the movement depends on EFA members collaborating more and more. So yes, I will be in touch. And thank you uh, so much for your talk. I think it stimulated an important, interesting discussion. So thank you all for coming. I hope I'll see at least a few of you in the uh, after party. And uh, we'll, be, um, we'll be back in two days at 4.30 p.m. Um, check our meetup and Facebook and Twitter for more info on that. Otherwise, we'll see you next month at second Tuesday at 7 p.m. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, thanks, everyone.